So Nate, are you ready to uh, to start? And I'll introduce you. Yeah, yeah ready okay. to go. Okay, <laughs> great. Welcome everybody to today's seminar. Um, my name is Sarah Booth and I'm the director of the Human Nutrition Research Center on Aging at Tufts University. Today, it's with great pleasure that I introduce our speaker, Dr. Nate Bassisti. Um, Dr. Bassisti is currently a postdoctoral fellow at the Buck Institute for Research on Aging. He received his PhD in pathology at the University of Washington, where he completed his thesis on the proteome turnover in mice, mouse aging using stable isotope technology for his in vivo studies. Prior to that, he did his bachelor's in biochemistry also at the University of Washington. Um, Nate's uh, curriculum vitae is so impressive for someone in his um, position. First of all, Nate has a K99 Pathway to Independence Award that was awarded this year from the National Institutes of Aging. Last year, his paper on po protein turnover and aging and longevity was the top cited paper in the journal Proteomics. Excuse me. <clears throat> in 2018, one of his, his paper in the Journal of Gerontology was the editor's choice, and that was stable isotope labeling, reveals novel insight into ubiquitin mediated protein aggregation with age, calorie restriction, and rapamycin treatment. Nate was a Glenn Foundation Research Training Fellow in, from 2016 to 2019 and received an award in aging research from the University of Pennsylvania in 2016. I could keep going on uh, with all his accolades and accomplishments, but I think instead what I'm going to do is turn the talk, the seminar over to Nate so that you can hear his ideas on proteomic solutions to aging problems from basic biology to clinical applications. So with that, Nate, I turn it over and we look forward to your seminar. Awesome, well, thank you, Sarah, for that very nice introduction. Um, and I am very happy to be here. Um, oh, am I sharing the right screen here? Uh, oh, one second, let me try this one more time. Oh yeah, I think this is correct. Th that's it, Proteopic Solutions, yep. Yes, okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, and uh, thank you for that introduction, Sarah. It's wonderful to be here. I'm happy to be here to tell you guys about my work uh, doing proteomics on, um, and I hope uh, that I can convince you by the end of the talk that proteomics is a really valuable tool, not only for looking at basic aging biology, but also to do, um, to do translational work on uh, aging in humans. So um, I don't think I need to convince you guys why it's important to study on aging, um, <laughs> uh, but I, I'll, so I'll just spend this one slide doing it. Um, so aging is the greatest risk factor for multiple chronic diseases that we get late in life including things like uh, heart disease, the big killers, heart disease, cancer, and Alzheimer's disease. So as we age, we have an increased risk of multiple different age-related diseases. And about, at about midlife, uh, our risk of getting all these things goes up very dramatically. And uh, also uh, death follows a very similar trajectory. And uh, what's uh, really important, I mean, to make things a little bit more depressing is um, you know, one of these things will probably, heart disease, cancer, Alzheimer's will probably kill us. But, you know, when we die, we'll probably have multiple of these things. We'll have multimorbidity. So aging is a really serious problem and it's very expensive. So late in life, can you imagine the cost of treating all these different diseases? So this is a very uh, problem to address health-wise and economically. Um, uh, but there, I think there, I mean, this is a little depressing, but there is a flip side to this. So uh, we in the aging field now believe and have, that we have identified uh, different uh, age, uh, basic aging processes. So we think 
that it's not a coincidence that our uh, risk of getting multiple diseases goes up with age, that there must be some basic uh, aging processes that drives this over time. And two of the processes that are now, um, that I've highlighted here are uh, loss of proteostasis and cellular senescence. Um, and I, I'm highlighting these two because these are what I'm, what I'm focused on, but now you know, there are multiple other basic aging processes now identified including um, things like DNA damage or mitochondrial dysfunction. And uh, the good news is that uh, presumably we should be able to target these basic aging processes to mitigate multiple uh, diseases of aging simultaneously. And instead of you know, the curve looking like this blue line, hopefully it could look more like this uh, green line down here. Um, one second, let me see if I can fix this pointer. I think it's a little bit tiny up uh, here. Ah, there we go. Okay, so, uh, so, and this has already been demonstrated in preclinical uh, studies in mice that we can actually target basic aging processes like senescence. So if we selectively eliminate senescent cells in mice, we can mit mitigate multiple diseases of aging. So this seems like a viable strategy that we could now try to employ in humans. And what's really notable about this is we've, uh, we've identified multiple aging interventions potentially. And what's notable is that uh, a lot of these are actually nutritional interventions. So there's the nutrition is, I think, very, can play a very important role here. For example, one of the best known uh, aging interventions is calorie restriction. And this is, this is, has a conserved effect right, from uh, single celled organisms like yeast to invertebrates to mammals, and it'll probably uh, have some effect in humans. Uh, protein restriction, uh, nutritional supplements, so um, there are nutritional supplements linked to improved health span. There's spermidine, there's terostilbene, the blueberry extract, there's um, uh, NAD supplements, right? That are all linked to improved health span. Of course, there are also um, uh, other lifestyle interventions like exercise that we know that we can do to uh, intervene in these basic aging processes and probably improve health. So I think that uh, focusing on nutrition is something that we can do now to potentially intervene in uh, aging related processes in humans. Another point I'd like to uh, highlight is that proteomics, uh, mass spec based proteomics is a very versatile and powerful tool to study uh, basic processes of the cell. Uh, and here is a slide that outlines some of the ways you can apply uh, mass spec based proteomics. But I, I really think it has many advantages. I mean, even if you focus on uh, the basic idea that you can use proteomics to quantify the abundance, identify proteins and quantify the abundance of them in a sample, I think uh, it has multiple advantages over traditional proteomic approaches. One of them being that it's quantitative and it's comprehensive, but really one of the, the big advantage of, advantages of mass spec based proteomics is that it's also unbiased. So uh, that means that you don't have to know the proteins you're measuring. So if you have a sample, you know, you have a uh, Normally people think of using like a protein panel or if you have a laboratory panel, there's a specific list of things you're measuring, but with mass spec, you don't have to know what's in your sample. You can ask the open-ended question, open -ended question, which proteins are there, uh, how much of them are there and how do they change with age or how do they change with this aging intervention? So I think this is a really important point because it shows that uh, proteomics is a, a way, you know, this is a way to discover new biology, new, new potential targets. So I think that's an important point to highlight about uh, unbiased mass spec based proteomics. Uh, there are a lot of ways uh, you can use, apply proteomics other than that, including, uh, for example, doing spatial proteomics. So looking at the localization of proteins in cells, looking at interactomes, how do proteins interact with each other? How do they interact with ligands you can look at? Uh, proteoform analysis. So which specific isoform of a protein is changing in a sample? How does a specific uh, post-translational -tran modification change in a sample? And mass spec really lends itself nicely to PTM analysis because you can look at not only which PTM is changing, but you can look at the specific amino acid site that is uh, being modified, right? So this is, that's really important. And finally, um, uh, I want to highlight if uh, that you can do protein turnover studies. So you can couple stable uh, pulse chase type labeling experiments um, with mass spec to do uh, studies of protein kinetics and protein turnover. Okay, so today I'd like to cover a few different topics. <laughs> in the first half, I'd like to talk about uh, protein turnover and its role in aging and longevity. So this is something I've really been working on for about the past 10 years. And I think protein turnover has a very central role in aging and longevity. 
I'd like to highlight one story where we looked at cardiac aging in um, mouse models of calorie restriction and rapamycin. And then uh, to talk about uh, something that's very, I think will be very important in my lab, which is to develop tools to measure protein turnover uh, and to make this a method more available to more labs. In the second half, I'd like to uh, uh, switch topics and talk to you about some of the work I've done on senescence, which has been the focus of my research during uh, uh, much of my postdoc. And finally, I'd like to end on how does this, why does this matter to you guys here, right? <laughs> and how does this, how does this relate to nutrition? So I'd like to come back to this at the very end. Um, so protein turnover and proteostasis is our uh, very important aspects of uh, aging and longevity. So in fact, uh, one of the best studied pathways in aging is the mTOR pathway. So mTOR is a molecule here that's part of a, um, a, a, a protein complex called TORC1, and this is a conserved nutrient sensing complex. And what this does is it uh, takes and integrates, um, senses levels of uh, nutrients in, in the environment and integrates those signals to tell the cell whether to grow whether to make new proteins or whether to break proteins down, right? So this is a conserved nutrient sensing complex uh, that, that exists in single-celled organisms also all the way up to humans. And um, when you have uh, conditions of nutrient excess, you have uh, a lot, you know, bigger signals coming from these sources. You're activating TORC1 torque, uh, torque and you're signaling to the cell that it's okay to synthesize more proteins and we don't need to recycle our proteins with autophagy, right? However, if you uh, inhibit TORC1 uh, using one of multiple interventions, for example, calorie restriction is one way to reduce these sig incoming signals into TORC1, or pharmacologically with something like rapamycin, you can inhibit signaling through the TORC complex this tells the cell there's not a lot of nutrients in the environment. So let's conserve, um, uh, let's, let's save energy and not produce as many proteins. So protein synthesis goes down and let's break down the proteins we have into their amino acid constituents so we can prioritize those for the proteins we really need, right? And so this is a really well-studied pathway and these are things that are known about the TORC pathway. But at the time when I was doing this uh, protein turnover study, oops, um, let me get this window out of here. <laughs> Hold on one second. Uh, I'm trying to get this out of here. There we go. Uh, one of the big, un one of the, um, one of the questions was, so normally when you give uh, a, a intervention like calorie restriction or rapamycin, you do this for a prolonged period of time to get longevity, right? So acutely, if you inhibit mTOR, it makes sense that you want to stop, you want to make less proteins and you want to uh, break down more proteins. But in a situation where you're doing prolonged treatment with calorie restriction or rapamycin, this doesn't necessarily make as much sense. You can't have more or less protein synthesis and more protein degradation over a long period of time because eventually you'll just run out of protein, right? So a big question in the field at the time was, okay, for a longer treatment period, eventually the proteome has to reach a new steady state, right? So what is that steady state? Um, and which proteins are most affected um, by treatment with calorie restriction and rapamycin. So to answer this question, uh, I turn to these uh, metabolic labeling approaches that couple, couple metabolic labeling with mass spectrometry. I took mice uh, treated for 10 weeks with either calorie restriction. So this is a 40% reduction in calories, but without malnutrition. So they're, su they're supplemented with uh, micronutrients to make up for the, the, the reduction in food. Uh, rapamycin treatment, this was microencapsulated into their diet at 14 parts per million, or uh, untreated mice, both young and old. And so these mice were treated, uh, put for 10 weeks on their respective treatments, after which they were put, all of the uh, leucine in their diet was now replaced with a heavy isotope, of, uh, synthetic isotope of leucine. So now for the this 17 day labeling period, the mice are eating a diet that contains a heavy isotope of leucine. When they ingest this, now the new proteins they synthesize will contain this heavier leucine. And downstream by mass spec, we can look at the incorporation of this leucine to determine protein turnover rates. So uh, I, we collected tissues over the 17 day labeling period at four different time points, three days, seven days, 12 days, and 17 days. And in this case, I'm gonna talk about a study we did in the heart. So uh, we collected the heart tissues and processed those for mass spec analysis. And then we did the, uh, the, the 
what I think is the most challenging part of the protocol, which is the data analysis. So at the time, uh, we had these, uh, we developed in-house uh, pipelines to do these analysis. Uh, our collaborators in the Macos lab created this topograph software. It does a, a isotopal log analysis of the signals coming from peptides with uh, zero, one, two, or uh, more heavy leucines. It uses that to tell us, to estimate the percentage of each protein that's newly synthesized. I wrote some R scripts that then takes this percentage of newly synthesized protein uh, and plots and does regressions of it over time according to first order kinetics. I can then solve for this, uh, this variable on the exponent to give us protein turnover and that can be directly uh, converted into half-life measurements. So then I uh, measure the half-lives of hundreds of proteins and then do statistical comparisons of how does the half-life of the protein change between young and old? How does it change in old mice that are then treated with calorie restriction? And then uh, look at which biological pathways are affected with um, ingenuity pathway analysis. So here, <clears throat> So I measured, I used this approach to measure the, ha the half-lives of hundreds of proteins in the mouse heart. And so here I'm gonna summarize the results uh, using old control mice as a baseline. So uh, the median half-life of proteins in the old mouse heart was 8.8 .8 days. So out of all the proteins we measured, this was the median. And so uh, what I'm showing down here is a, a distribution of half-lives in young mice compared to old mice where old mice are, uh, the, are represented by zero here. And you can see the ratio of young to old uh, represented by this distribution. So about uh, more than half of the proteins in young mice had longer half-lives than, than old mice. Uh, and then, you know, some of them had lower half-lives here. But overall, uh, the median half-life of proteins in young mice is not significantly different, but 3% different. So 9.1 day median. Now, if we take and look at old mice that are now calorie restricted, we see a significant increase in the half-lives of protein. So it goes up by 30% up to 11.4 day median. And I think this is not necessarily surprising because if you're eating less food uh, that over a prolonged period, you'd expect that you need to make your, the proteins that you have last longer, right? And, uh, and then in, in rapamyce and treated mice, similarly, we saw an increase in uh, protein half-lives, not as much as with CR, but by about 12% to 9.8 days, right? And so I hypothesized that one of the explanations for why um, calorie restriction in rapamycin fed mice can maintain their proteins for this much longer is that they, can, they have improved proteome quality. So one way to measure this is by looking at protein carbonylation. So this is a surrogate measurement of protein oxidation, total protein oxidation in the cell. And what I saw was that uh, in old calorie restricted and old rapamycin and fed mice, we have a significant reduction in protein oxidation. So this may, this, uh, may at least uh, in part explain why calorie restricted and rapamycin and fed mice are able to maintain their proteins for uh, a longer half-life, right? And one of the nice, nice things about proteomics is that we don't have to just look at the whole proteome. We can look at the specific proteins that were changing um, the most. So what I did is I took and looked at the proteins that were most changed by calorie restriction and rapamycin here, and then did some pathway analysis. And one of the interesting things that I found was that uh, the, top, the top enriched pathways were mitochondrial metabolic pathways. So here we have, uh, uh, for example, um, notably uh, oxidative phosphorylation, TCA cycle and branch chain amino acid metabolism. And these are uh, a heat map of protein half-life changes compared to old mice again. So here where everything in red is an increase in protein half-life and everything in blue is a decrease in half-life compared to old untreated mice. And you can see that pretty much across the board uh, uh, in both calorie restriction and rapamycin, we see an increase in the half-lives of all these uh, mitochondrial and metabolic proteins. So this to me indicated that maybe one of the ways that calorie restriction and rapamycin are affecting the, the heart is by improving mitochondrial metabolism. So it's well known that with age, mitochondrial metabolism in the heart actually decreases and switches to glycolysis. So uh, to test whether this indicated increased uh, a, a, sub, a sh shift in substrate utilization to um, TCA and mitochondrial metabolism, we did some um, targeted metabolic profiling on old mouse hearts, uh, either controlled or treated with rapamycin. And what we saw is that uh, there was a significant reduction in 
uh, glycolysis uh, uh, metabolites and a significant increase in TCA cycle um, metabolites. And you can see this uh, diagram here on the right where basically all these TCA cycle intermediates were uh, increased in uh, old mice treated with rapamycin. So there's an increase in mitochondrial metabolism and a decrease in the glycolysis uh, metabolism. And these changes were correlated with uh, improvements in uh, cardiac function. So here are uh, graphs showing this. So on the left, we're looking at um, cardiac hypertrophy, which is me measured by left ventricular mass index. And in young mice at the beginning and end of the experiment, they were untreated, there was no difference. But with age, you can see there's a, a significant increase in cardiac hypertrophy. And now in aged mice treated with either calorie restriction or with rapamycin, there's a significant reversal of this hypertrophy. And again, if we look at heart function measured by myocardial performance index, uh, this was done by measured from echocardiography data. Um, again, a higher score in this case means worse heart function. So, uh, with age, you see um, uh, uh, worse uh, myocardial performance index in old mice, but in old mice treated with either calorie restriction or rapamycin, we see a significant rejuvenation here. So this was a really important finding in our study because it shows that even uh, cardiac dysfunction, age-related cardiac dysfunction that's already established uh, uh, can be reversed after treatment with either of these interventions, which is really important. But um, I think one of the, the, the points I want to get across with this study is that you can use stable isotope labeling to do comprehensive measurements of protein turnover. And I really like this study as an example because we saw improved protein quality uh, and reduced turnover, but particularly reduced turnover in mitochondrial metabolism. This pointed us to a potential mechanism um, for improvements in heart function, which was improved mitochondrial metabolism. And this correlated with a reversal in cardiac aging. So I think this was a nice way to tie uh, uh, to do proteomics and actually having to look at turnover to, to point to a mechanism of how we, we, we saw improvement. And uh, we've now taken this method and applied it in multiple different uh, mouse aging studies and multiple different longevity models. So uh, we've published a slew of papers on this now. Uh, but one thing that I think that was really interesting, I mean, summarizing basically all of the work that I've done in turnover is that when we look at calorie restriction, any uh, mouse model of longevity. So if we look at calorie restricted mice, rapamycin treated mice, or um, another long lived mouse model I've looked at, which are the MCAT mice, these are uh, transgenic mice that overexpress this anti antioxidant enzyme called catalase to their mitochondria and they live uh, longer and have fewer age-related diseases. So in all these cases, uh, the degree of a lifespan extension is actually correlated to the degree of uh, 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 extension in protein half-lives, which is really interesting. So, you know, it indicates that maybe uh, longer proteome half-lives are an indicator of a healthy, health, healthier proteome and maybe a biomarker for whether a longevity intervention will work. Um, and this was uh, confirmed independently uh, by the Hellerstein group. So they actually confirmed some of the data we had shown in calorie restriction and rapamycin. And they also looked at another long lived mouse model called the smell dwarf mouse. And they saw exactly the same thing that longer half-lives correlated to longer life. And even more recently, uh, people have taken this into long lived rodent models and shown the same thing. So uh, Vera Gorbanova, who's um, who looks at naked mole rat aging, and she's at University of Rochester, together with Sina Gamagami, who does protein turnover work uh, at University of Rochester. They've shown now naked mole rats have longer protein half-lives than their moose musculus uh, counterparts. And again, more recently, um, the other person who looks at naked mole rats, which in aging is Shelley Buffenstein. So she's at Calico now, uh, which is the Google spinoff aging company. And she recently dropped a paper in BioArchive showing the same thing, that naked mole rats have a much longer protein half-lives than their moose musculus counterparts. So I think that all of this really, uh, to me, indicates that maybe longer proteins are a requirement for longer life. That's it's kind of interesting to me. And I think it underlines how important uh, it is to look at protein turnover in, uh, in aging biology. One other interesting observation here is that the models that I've looked at, calorie restriction, rapamycin and MCAT, 
they're all modulators of nutrient and energy sensing networks. So I think that underlines that nutrition might have a central role also in regulating protein turnover and in turn uh, regulating longevity as well. So overall, I hope that this uh, shows you that you know mass spec based approaches are very useful for studying aging biology and uh, basic aging processes like protein turnover. And I think there's a lot of demand to do these kind of studies uh, going forward in different aging and disease models. But one, um, one of the things, um, one of the problems with this approach, I think, is that it's very difficult for most labs to do. So one of the things that I've been focused on for the last couple of years is to make this approach more um, widely available to more labs. Uh, and uh, the reason for, I think the reason this approach is so difficult to do is not, um, there are basically two phases here. There's a metabolic labeling phase and there's a data analysis phase. So the metabolic labeling is fairly um, straightforward, even although it's uh, somewhat expensive. But um, the real bottleneck in performing these experiments is really in the data analysis. So I think only a handful of specialized laboratories are able to, um, to do these kind of analysis properly. And the problem is that they usually design the, the data analysis pipelines in-house and only, only their lab is the only one that normally uses it. Um, and so I think uh, in order to get over this problem, what I've been working on for the last couple of years was I took and repackaged and rewrote our data analysis pipeline in R uh, and now we've uh, created a tool. This isn't public yet, but it'll, uh, we hope to have this published very soon. A tool we call Turnover. Uh, and I, this isn't a very creative name, but at least you know what it does. So uh, turnover is a tool that uh, allows you to calculate protein turnover uh, rates. And the reason this is important, I think the, 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 the most important part of this is that we're now integrating this tool into a widely used proteomics platform called Skyline. So I've teamed up now with the core development of this um, uh, proteomics software. This was developed at the, in the McCoss lab at the University of Washington. Uh, he's a former mentor of mine. And then the lead developer of the software is Brendan McLean here. And now working together with them, we've been able to integrate this tool into Skyline. Um, oh, and I'd like to just give a, a shout out to a research associate in, in the Schilling lab here at the Buck Institute. He was instrumental in helping me. Cameron Werfritz was instrumental in helping me to, uh, to get these, uh, this whole tool repackaged and, and rewritten into R. So um, yeah. So uh, now what we've done is we worked together with the Skyline development team to core development team to integrate some key features that are needed for protein turnover analysis in Skyline. One of these uh, very essential features was the ability to permute isotope modifications in Skyline. So here I'm just showing one example peptide in a Skyline document that has three uh, concurrent leucines. And so what's really important to be able to do is look at the signal contribution for uh, whether you have one heavy leucine, two, the second heavy leucine, the third heavy leucine, or if it's the, just two of the leucines that are heavy, or if it's all of them that are heavy. So you need to be able to uh, take and integrate the, look at the relative signal of all of those permutations of heavy leucine in order to properly calculate protein turnover. So now we've integrated a, 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 the ability to do that into the Skyline uh, software. And now after you permute your isotope modifications, you can open up our tool, uh, put in your settings and push go. And, and what it does is it performs this isotopolog uh, analysis. It performs regressions. It performs statistical comparisons between treatment groups and then provides summary reports of, uh, of uh, protein turnover changes. So now I've taken uh, all the data I presented to, to earlier on calorie restriction and now run this through our new tool in Skyline. And here's a, an example of some of the summary data that you can get. So here on the left is a, a, is a graph summarizing the percentage of newly synthesized protein in, for all proteins in the proteome for uh, control, old control mice or calorie restricted mice. And you can see that over time from day three to seven to 12 to 17, there's an increase in the percentage of newly synthesized protein. This uh, increase is slower in calorie restricted mice, right? And uh, not only can you get these bigger summaries, but we, we spit out reports of all the individual protein changes. So on the right here are some example regressions of uh, the incorporation of newly synthesized protein in uh, calorie restricted mice in blue or um, control mice in red. 
for four different proteins, and each of these proteins is incorporated significantly slower in old calorie restricted mice versus old control mice, as you'd expect, right? So, uh, so we're very excited to to be launching this tool very soon, and I'm hoping to use this going forward in more aging studies, hopefully nutrition studies and hopefully in human studies, I think it would be really nice applications for this tool going forward. Okay, so that's uh, a lot of the work I've done on protein turnover. Uh, I'd like to shift gears now and talk about another basic aging process, uh, which is cellular senescence. So cellular senescence is a very important basic aging process. And it's also, um, and what it is, is it's a, a stress response. So that if you imagine a healthy dividing cell and it encounters a stress, there's a few things that can happen. That healthy cell can recover and then continue to divide. Or if it's a bad enough stress, that cell will die. Or there's a third option. So that a cell that encounters a stress can also become senescent. And what that means is that it becomes uh, uh, permanently and irreversibly growth arrested. So the healthy dividing cell stops dividing forever. And then it begins to secrete um, a variety of proteins, both soluble and, ex and exosome proteins, that are collectively known as the senescence associated secretory phenotype or SASP for short. So remember SASP, that the SASP is the stuff secreted by senescent cells because I use the word SASP a lot from here on out. So um, with age, the uh, senescent cells accumulate in virtually all of our tissues and via the paracrine actions of the SASP are believed to drive multiple diseases of aging. It's also important to know that there's multiple ways of making cells senescent. So um, including but not limited to things like genotoxic stress. So radiation or uh, telomere attrition uh, can induce senescence, uh, oncogenic stresses, so overexpression of the RAS oncogene, or even certain treatments that patients take, like the uh, cancer chemotherapy doxorubicin or the HIV protease inhibitor atazanivir, these treatments can drive cells into senescence. So it's really important to actually understand the biology of senescence and the SASP, not only for their roles in aging and diseases, but also clinically relevant to patients that currently take these drugs, right? And senes senescent cells may be driving some of the side effects associated with taking these drugs. So uh, it's been shown very exhaustively at this point in many studies that if you selectively eliminate senescent cells in mice, <laughs> that uh, you promote health and longevity and mitigate all these age-related diseases, right? So uh, I was very interested in doing proteomics on the SAS for a variety of reasons. And first of all, to actually get an unbiased uh, and comprehensive perspective of what's in the SAS, but to understand also the heterogeneity of the SAS phenotype. So how is it different between different cell types? What about if you use different uh, induced uh, stresses to make cells senescent, right? Uh, I'm very interested in the idea that the SAS can be used as biomarkers of a senescence burden and of aging. And this is very important because there are massive efforts now to develop drugs to, um, that for humans uh, that selectively eliminate senescent cells. Those are called senolytics or selectively alter the SAS phenotype, which are called xenomorphics. And a critical part of developing this in humans is getting senescence, biomarkers of senescence burden because we need a biomarker to tell us, you know, this person has a high senescent cell burden, we should treat them with a senolytic. And then after they're treated, we need a biomarker to tell us, oh, uh, this treatment worked, right? And uh, this is true not only for, um, you know, senolytic uh, drugs that are being developed, but also nutritional interventions. So there are nutritional interventions that have senolytic or xenomorphic activity. Uh, and in whether it's nutritional or pharmacological, uh, you know, treatment that you're using, these senescence biomarkers will be critical. And finally, knowing what's in the SAS will tell us about aging mechanisms. So to uh, profile the SAS, what I've done is I took uh, primary human cells and culture, and I used several different stresses to induce senescence in vitro, genotoxic, oncogenic, and treatment stresses, once the cells become senescent, I collect the conditioned media, which contains the secreted proteins from the SASP, and then process those uh, for mass spec analysis. And uh, what I found was that the SASP was much larger than previously thought. So there are about a thousand unique SASP factors that I've identified so far. But what's more important is that the SASP is a very heterogeneous phenotype. So here I'm showing an example of three different SASP uh, phenotypes, genotoxic stress-induced, oncogene-induced and treatment-induced SASP. And you can see in each case, these are largely distinct SASP profiles. So it'll be 
very important to, uh, uh, so it's very, this is important because they could be driving different biologies. Um, so it's gonna be important to have biomarkers, both of specific inducers, uh, SAS, uh, senescence inducers, but I was also interested on whether there are some universal um, markers and signatures to the SAS. So I focused on 150, about 150 SAS proteins that are in common. So these are secreted regardless of the inducer you use. And I call these the core SAS. And to look for like a core biological signature, signature of senescence, I did some pathway and network analysis. And I found that there were primarily three uh, broad categories of pathways and networks in the SAS. Uh, the largest one by far was involved in tissue structure or an organization. So things that are involved in ECM building and ECM breaking down, um, cytoskeletal, like structural uh, pathways, right? Uh, unsurprisingly, there was also a growth in metabolism arm. So probably not surprising that a growth arrested cell has this. And the SASP is well known to have uh, growth factors like IGFBPs. And finally, there was interestingly um, a, a arm of uh, pathways that was involved, that's related to neurodegeneration. So I think maybe there's some potential here to look at the role of senescence in, uh, in the SASP and neurodegeneration as well. So I'm interested in not only the biological signatures of senescence of the SASP, but which specific proteins might make the best biomarkers, right, for senescence burden in vitro. So to help crystallize those out, I did um, some unbiased clustering analysis. So uh, shown here, and I picked out some of the top candidates that were most robustly expressed in, across all of our different inducers. These include proteins like CXCL1, MMP1, staniocalcin, a handful of serpents, and GDF15. And uh, here I was particularly excited about uh, STC1 because at the time this was, um, this was, not, was never a uh, previously unknown SAS factor, but here we've identified it, a novel factor and it turns out to be one of the most robust ones across multiple treatments. So really excited about that. Uh, but then all of these things that I've highlighted here are now um, the most robustly secreted proteins and probably are, are these were our top uh, biomarker candidates for people. And just to give you an idea of how robust these were, uh, these are, here I'm showing a graph showing the, uh, the full change in secretion of all of these factors by senescent cells versus non-senescent cells. And I just wanna point out here that this is a log two scale. So these were very, very robust changes in secretion. And to test whether these would make good biomarkers of aging in human plasma, what we then did was we teamed up with um, uh, Luigi Ferrucci um, and Toshiko Tanaka. Luigi Ferrucci is the a scientific director at the NIA and the head of the Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Aging. And Tosh, uh, actually, I heard that <laughs> Sarah told me recently that she, Tosh had actually gotten the, her PhD with you guys at Tufts. So yeah, it's great. It's a, um, it's a pleasure to work with her and we're still collaborating with her on uh, studies right now. And so what Tosh and uh, Luigi had done is they've, they were working on finding uh, protein biomarkers of aging in human plasma. And so they identified it about 220 significant biomarkers. And uh, to see whether the SASP is a good source of biomarkers, we overlaid this with the core SASP. And by we, I mean, um, here's myself and Birgit Schilling, who's my current mentor. So we took this picture to, to, to cause we found this picture of Luigi and Tosh online and we wanted to make the slide symmetrical. So here's our, uh, her, our clone picture of theirs over here. Uh, anyway, so what we saw is when we look at the overlap between the core SASP and plasma aging biomarkers, Remarkably, about a quarter of all the SAS proteins are also significant biomarkers of aging in people. And uh, among our top candidates, uh, our top candidates were also among Tosh and Luigi's top candidates, which was really interesting. And for example, if you look at GDF15, uh, in Tosh's study, uh, GDF15 was the single protein with the strongest, most significant association with aging in plasma. And she was able to go back and reproduce this on a subset of her cohorts with uh, using ELISAs. So this is very interesting. And I think uh, has a lot of potential, the, the core SAS has a lot of potential to be used as biomarkers of aging in humans. Okay, so I would mentioned earlier that we're, I'm not only interested in the core SAS, but also um, that it's likely that different types of senescent cells will be important in different uh, contexts. So it's equal, I think equally important to make, develop um, inducer specific signatures of senescent cells. So here I just want to present how I come up with one inducer specific signature with RAS induced senescence. 
So here, there are about 370 proteins that are secreted by RAS senescent cells, but not other types of senescent cells. But this is a much, uh, I think, too big of a panel to use as a biomarker. So to really crystallize the, you know, the most robust proteins out of this, I did a multi-omic analysis. So I took in all the, um, all the proteins that were secreted uh, exclusively by RAS-induced senescent cells from our study. And then I looked at the overlap between that and the genes that are exclusively expressed by RAS-induced senescence from previously published studies to come up with this really coarse signature for RAS-induced senescence. And this brought me down to 26 genes total, but only five of these were really robust across all the data sets I looked at. So now if I look at the r secretome data or look at um, two different transcriptome data sets, I have now have uh, this set of five, uh, five different proteins that are robustly um, expressed or secreted by RAS-induced senescent cells. And again, this is a log two scale, so these are fairly robust changes. And so I think I, pro I propose this as a, a potential biomarker panel for RAS-induced senescence in vivo. Okay, so to summarize what I've shown you so far about senescence, uh, I've identified over a thousand unique SAS factors so far, and this is a tenfold increase in the known SAS. Um, and uh, I've seen that senescence indu inducers drive largely distinct SAS phenotypes. So now I've taken all these different SAS um, profiles and put them uh, into a publicly available uh, database called SAS Atlas. And my hope is that people who are suspect what the, uh, the senescence might be involved in what you're studying, you can go into this atlas and see if uh, whatever molecule, of, what molecule you're interested in is actually part of the SAS, then that might actually link your phenotype to senescence. So uh, I hope that this is a, a resource that uh, researchers can use. And finally, I think that the core and inducer specific SASPs are promising biomarkers of senescence and aging in humans. Okay, so everything I've shown you up until now is um, stuff that's now published. So going forward into my, what I, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what I'd like to focus on going forward in terms of senescence. And this is work that's now uh, partially going to be funded by a K99R00. And now I'd like to shift my focus away from the secretome of senescent cells, but really focus on now the surface zone of senescent cells. And I think that this has many advantages over looking to, at the secretome. Uh, one of the things that we can begin to do with the surface home is look at the heterogeneity of senescent cells again and classify them based on their surface profiles. But one of the real advantage of surface proteins is that they can make therapeutic targets for you know, genolytic drugs or for uh, immunotherapies. So this is a way to identify potential therapeutic targets. But one of the things I'm most excited about is that we could potentially use a cell surface target to uh, isolate senescent cells from, from tissues. So everything I've shown you up until now is studies where I've taken healthy cells and cultured them in vitro and then made them senescent artificially using some kind of you know, um, artificial uh, stressor, right? But um, what we don't have a way of doing right now is to take and isolate senescent cells that became senescent in vivo to isolate those and then examine them. So I think with, with a cell surface marker, we can potentially isolate, isolate those kind of senescent cells from tissue and study in vivo senescent cells. Uh, and this opens the door for more uh, precision and personalized medicine approaches. So I've identified a specific set of benchmarks to accomplish this. So one of the, the, the key uh, first steps in doing this is to identify the surface home of senescent cells, right? And then to validate these with a secondary method and then uh, downstream to actually validate that these are on the surface of senescent cells in vivo. And then once we validated them in vivo, we can begin to do the fun stuff, which is to isolate senescent cells from tissues. So starting at the beginning here, I've now um, established a surface zone pipeline. So to do this, I use a um, method called cell surface capture cou coupled to mass spec. And so the way this works is that I use this uh, non-cell permeable uh, uh, biotinylation reagent. I can add this to live cells and culture. And what it does is it biotinylates all the primary light, uh, all the primary amines. So the lysine is accessible on the outsides of the cells. And then I can quench the reaction and, and uh, digest, harvest and digest these samples. And then uh, I can take the peptides and now avid and enrich the biotinylated peptides, which were on the surface of, of the cells back here and analyze those by mass spec. Uh, to get the surface home. So as proof of 
proof of principle. I've now done this in uh, human lung fibroblast. And so I've been able to identify um, six, uh, almost 700 proteins on the surfaceome of lung uh, fibroblasts, and about 100 of these that are differentially expressed on senescent cells compared with non-senescent cells. And now going forward, I've been able to validate three of these targets by flow cytometry. And so uh, now I'd like to take the things as they're validated, uh, go into the next stage, which would be uh, in validation of these markers in vivo in human tissues. And for this, uh, I've been established collaboration with Luigi Perucci. So he was gonna provide human specimens. Uh, but you know, one thing I would really be excited about is working with uh, people here at HNRCA. You guys work a lot with human cohorts. So it'd be really exciting to actually do this validation in some of your studies uh, uh, to validate whether senescent cell, you know, these surface or markers. And then in, once these are validated in vivo, the fun step will be to actually begin to isolate the senescent cells from tissues. So the idea here is, again, with Luigi Ferrucci or maybe uh, with the HNRCA here, um, Luigi Ferrucci routinely does these punch biopsies. So the idea is that he'd provide, uh, he'd do a punch biopsy and give me a tissue uh, sample that has some senescent cells. I'd make a single cell suspension and then use this validated surface cell marker to isolate the senescent cells. And now for the first time, we can look at senescent cells from in vivo by various different approaches to phenotype them. And eventually it would be really cool to do uh, compound screening. So what could you imagine if you took your own senescent cells, uh, you were able to take your own senescent cells and then screen for compounds that have the best senolytic activity for you. So I think this would be a really cool uh, thing to do down the line. Um, so this is, I'm very excited about this project. So now I'd like to come back uh, to this question of how is this all relevant to uh, HNRCA? How is it relevant to what you guys do here? So I, I think uh, I wanna just present some ideas and these are, I don't know how feasible it is to use these on current studies going on, but to mostly to spark discussion of how we can uh, combine you know, some of uh, the tools that I'm, I'm working on and some of the, the models and the human cohorts and different biology that's being done here uh, to do uh, to to do some studies. So, one of the big questions I think uh, we can look at is how does nutrition affect protein turnover? I think this is a really low hanging fruit. And so, um, one thing I've actually heard is that you guys have had some experience doing these uh, isotope tracing studies in humans. I think I would be very excited to be able to do my first studies of protein turnover in humans with um, some of the labs here. So, for example, I know. Um, you know, you have the engage study looking at exercise. You have several different nutritional studies. The, here, I think this is the, the strawberry and raspberry studies and the ADAPT studies. And I don't know about these specific studies if we can, you can't incorporate them here, but for example, studies like this, we could give a nutritional intervention in a human model and then uh, do stable isotope tra tracing before and after the intervention and ask how does this affect protein turnover? So that would be really, uh, I think something that's really exciting. Another thing we can look at is how does nutrition, what is the interplay between nutrition and senescent phenotypes? So even, um, you know, before going into humans, maybe we could even uh, look at how nutritional interventions uh, affect senescent phenotypes in cells. So uh, we get, if you apply a nutritional intervention in cell culture, we could examine uh, senescent phenotypes. How is the SASP affected and how is the surface of almost senescent, uh, uh, senescent cells changed, right? Or we could take these, uh, look at, uh, study this question in people as well. So again, uh, looking at your human cohort studies, wouldn't it be cool to see, okay, so now uh, a human that's given a nutritional intervention, how are their senescence biomarkers changing? Is their senescence burden going down? And eventually once I get the pipeline established, what if we uh, isolate senescent cells from these different patient populations and study those? So that, I think these are all very interesting things we could do down the line. And finally, I'd like to end by saying that proteomics is a collaborative tool. There are a lot of different things you can do. I've highlighted some protein turnover, biomarker research, uh, multiomics. Um, we can look at PTMs and we can look at protein ligand interactions. And I actually, have, I've added one last idea here and then I'll end after this is, you know, one interesting thing to look at could be protein ligand interactions. So you guys do studies on vitamin K, DB12 and folic acid. One thing we can do with mass spec is to look at um, uh, what are the protein targets that these vitamins bind to. So there is an assay called SETSA-MS, cellular thermal shift assay with mass spec. 
we can do this to identify um, uh, vitamin interacting proteins. So I think there's, there's a lot of interesting biology that you could do here. Okay, so with that, I'd like to end by thanking um, uh, all the labs that were involved in this work, the Schilling Lab and Campisi Labs at the Buck uh, and all their support on the senescence work. Uh, the McCossett Rabinovich Labs at University of Washington for, again, with their collaborations on the protein turnover work, my collaborators in the Ferrucci Lab, my surface home collaborators, my funding sources, and uh, I'd like to thank all you guys for your attention, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so very, very much, Nate. That was um, a very, very stimulating um, seminar, and um, I really appreciate how you're seeing places where great collaborations, great science can happen. So we have a question. I encourage everyone to Put, enter your questions in the Q&A um, option at the bottom of your screen. But while people are typing, Roger Fielding, our associate director, has asked a question. And he said, in the heart, contractile and metabolic activity is chronically high. Do you know what happens to protein turnover and carbonylation in skeletal muscle, which is more intermittently active? Thank you. Oh, oh, that's a very good question. Um, I do know, so I do know uh, what happens uh, in in the context of calorie restriction and rapamycin. So what we've seen pretty much in every tissue uh, is that the protein uh, half lives are increasing with either calorie restriction or rapamycin treatment. Uh, I have not looked at protein carbonylation specifically in skeletal muscle, so that's a very good question. Uh, yeah, that's a very good question because, uh, as you said, uh, the heart is always going, but the, the muscle is more intermittent. So that's uh, something that we have yet to, I think, to investigate thoroughly. <laughs> Great. Okay, thank you. So Sheldon Rowan, who is one of our uh, scientists at the HNRCA, said, "Great talk. Your work on senescence has focused on cultured fibroblasts." Do you know how those will relate to senescence, epithelial cells in vivo? Ah, uh, yes. Um, oh, I think they'll be very different. <laughs> That's a very good question. So what we already know, because I did, so I've shown, I showed you all the data from fibroblasts, but we have, uh, I've now looked at several cell types. And with different cell types, you see the same exact thing um, that, uh, the senescent phenotype is very dependent and different in, in different cell types. So I am sure in epithelial cells, it'll be quite different. Uh, and for example, one thing uh, I've seen in at least in, in renal epithelial cells, for example, um, compared with fibroblasts is in fibroblasts, I do see uh, secretion of these damps, uh, these damage associated molecular pattern proteins, but, um, and a lot of these ECM modifying proteins, but those are largely not going up in uh, the renal epithelial cells. Yeah. Uh, and then the question of uh, looking in vivo, well, that's a whole nother question. So that's something we'll have to validate once we get into in, in vivo models as well. So yeah, very good question. Great. So um, Alan Taylor, one of our lead scientists, asked the question regarding uh, calorie restriction and rampamycin effect on protein carbonyls. Is the decrease in glycolysis and incre increase in TCA consistent? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, well, you would think um, an increase in mitochondrial, I, I think the reason you asked that is that you would think maybe an increase in mitochondrial metabolism would increase ROS, right? Because the mitochondria are <laughs> producing the ROS. So that's a good question. So I think that um, one of the answers to that is we did look at the expression of antioxidant enzymes in these models. So even though you have increased mitochondrial metabolism, and which is potentially increasing the production of ROS. I think there's, there's also an increase in the expression of, of antioxidant enzymes, which is, I think, curtailing that. So I think maybe that, uh, it is consistent if, if you look at all of that data together. That's a good question, yeah. Great. So another of our lead scientists, Dr. Andy Greenberg, asked the question, 
alterations in the protein aldehyde dehydrogenase 2 would both promote cardiac protein carbonylation and protein turnover. Have you correlated your observations with that protein? Ah, okay. Uh, I have not looked specifically uh, at that protein. Um, uh, I actually was not aware of that. That's a, a, a really interesting comment. I wasn't aware of the, con of the, the or never thought about the connection, potential connection between aldehyde dehydrogenase, dehydrogenase 2 and cardiac protein carbonylation. So I haven't done that. That's a good question. And um, uh, I should go back to the data and, and I'll look at those correlations. <laughs> Thank you for that comment. <laughs> Great. So um, Nate, I'm going to ask you a practical question, and and um, the the practical question relates to the fact that the HNRCA um, was one of the sites for the first human calorie restriction trial, and um, that um, that study ended quite a few years ago. So my practical question to you are, what are the limitations on archive samples from human studies um, that um, one would have to take into consideration before asking you to do your wonderful magic um, and on samples? <laughs> oh, that's a really good question. So uh, uh, with, actually you can do a lot of, uh, you know, there are a lot of things you can do on the on archived human uh, samples. It depends really um, how they're archived. So uh, one of the things is, you know, I'm, I'm assuming if you're talking about like frozen samples. So frozen samples um, kept at minus 80 or in liquid nitrogen can last quite a long time with very small uh, impacts on, um, you know, our proteomic results. So I think what matters maybe uh, more if you're talking about plasma, then the method of plasma collection, um, whether they're collected you know, in like the EDTA vials or not, um, and whether the collection method is consistent between the different samples that you're looking at, uh, these will all be important factors in them doing the downstream proteomic analysis. Some of the buffers you can collect uh, samples in are more conducive to downstream mass spectrometry analysis. So um, that's an important consideration. But I think like uh, if you have banked frozen tissues from a, you know, from a calorie restriction study, then I think there are not too much limitations on what you can do in terms of looking at um, doing you know, shotgun proteomic analysis. Great, thank oh, you. Does that answer your question, Sarah? It does, that, and Dr. Yeah. Cy Das, who is um, heir apparent to generation two of the calorie restriction studies from the National Institute of Aging, said okay. that the SASP was done, but she was going to ask about the surfaceomes. So I think you've answered her question, so thank you. <laughs> Dr. Fielding says, excellent seminar. Thank you. I think a lot of people are going off now because of time. One last question, Nate. <laughs> uh, Dr. Alan Taylor said, lovely talk. Um, what have you found regarding function of the ubiquitin proteolytic pathway in calorie restriction and rampamycin? Oh, very good question. Um, yeah, so one of the things we do see, because we do see so such changes in turnover, uh, so you'd expect that you'd also see this reflected in the ubiquitin proteosome system, right? And uh, I have not, I've, I have looked into that a bit, so I actually had done one study specifically looking at the turnover of ubiquitinated proteins. And one of the really, and this was in the liver, uh, livers of mice treated with calorie restriction and rapamycin. And one of the really interesting things I saw there was that with age, there's actually an accumulation of um, pre-existing uh, ubiquitinated proteins with age. So there are, pro there are ubiquitinated proteins that are not getting turned over. Uh, but then if you give a mouse uh, calorie restriction or rapamycin, main, it's mostly calorie restrictions. Now these are suddenly being cleared out. So whether this is somehow through autophagy or through the proteasome, I don't know, but I think it's really interesting that we even see this accumulation of ubiquitinated uh, <laughs> proteins that are not being turned over with age that we can then do something about with calorie restriction, I think is very interesting. Great. Yeah.
Well, thank you. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to cut the questions off now. But Nate, that was a wonderful seminar. And I want to thank all our participants for uh, joining us. Nate, we can just stay on while everyone gets off. So okay. great. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Eleanor, you can stop recording.